I'm Chloe, and today we will be talking about the coup of 18 Brumaire, year eight. The coup of 18 Brumaire, or November 9th, tells the story of how General Napoleon Bonaparte came to power in France. It is surprisingly bloodless, but reveals just how far the French Revolution had fallen since its start. The coup d'etat of 1799 signified the end of the revolution, the overthrow of the Directory, and the start of the Consulate, returning France to absolutism under Napoleon. Masterminded by a small group of politicians and fueled by secrecy, the coup of 18 Brumaire served as a swift and clever method to both unite France and put power back into the hands of an absolute ruler. While the event itself faced few hiccups, the deceitful plans of Emmanuel Joseph Sayez, CM de Talleyrand, and Napoleon Bonaparte went off with success and to little opposition, clearing the path for Napoleon to feed his appetite for power throughout the ensuing decade. By early 1799, the French Republic faced an absolute crisis. The military encountered losses left and right, the fear of invasion ran high, and excessive taxes caused tension and uprisings within. This disorder was most often attributed to the current government of France, the Directory. The Directory of France was a bicameral legislature with an executive branch consisting of five leaders or directors. The two chambers of the legislative branch included the Council of 500, who proposed legislation, and the Council of Ancients, who either passed or vetoed it. In addition, the Ancients' power included appointing a new director every year, pre-approved by the 500. Directors, who had to have served in either chamber prior to their selection, chose all other government officials, such as military generals, tax collectors, ministers, and ambassadors. Due to their rank over the legislative branch and even its endorsement of the distinction, the directors held the most power in governing France. The directory's attempt to please both left and right failed spectacularly, as the Jacobins were offended by the sham republic and conservatives scoffed at the weak dictatorship. While the corrupt directory fell out of favor with the French, it was plagued by putting down continuous radical Jacobin uprisings and peasant revolts. Generals disagreed with the detrimental military organization, feeling as if the government sent them into battle to lose. They too sided with left-wing revolutionaries and talked of the old ways of the radical revolution returning. To the people of France, it looked like civil war was coming soon. But within the highly unpopular directory, a group of government leaders started to believe that only absolute power and order could stabilize the nation. Emmanuel Joseph Sayez, one of the five directors, his colleague Pierre Roger Ducot, French Minister of Police and notorious anti-leftist Joseph Fouché, and Director Paul Barat became involved in a plot to unseat the Directory at the first signs of Neo-Jacobins rising again. Sayez's overarching plan involved a head and a sword, him being the brains behind the operation and a staunch general being its figurehead. The plan originally revolved around the five directors stepping down, forcing legislative bodies to draft the new constitution. However, to have the action even considered, there needed to be a substantial threat to France's current government that would believably cause the directors to resign. All the while, Sayez searched meticulously for the right sword. His first pick had been Barthélemy Catherine Jobert. He then organized a few military wins for Jobert, believing that a reputation for victory was the way to gain the public's trust. However, Jobert was ultimately killed in battle. But in the fall of 1799, General Napoleon Bonaparte fatefully returned to France after a disastrous campaign in Egypt to challenge British forces. Overwhelmed by their fondness for him regardless, people rejoiced in the streets, holding celebrations in every town he passed through. Bonaparte's previous victories had already established his reputation as the bringer of peace, and from then, Sayez had found his sword. While in his brother Lucien's home, Napoleon agreed to work alongside Sayez to overthrow the Directory, despite their history of not getting on well. A bit more than a week from the coup d'etat, Sayez worked closely with Talleyrand, Bonaparte's chief advisor at the time, who acted as an intermediary between the two. To urge the legislators for a new constitution, the plotters pretended that a radical Jacobin uprising was headed for Paris, and plastered fake propaganda posters all over the city as night fell over the 17th. The plan went smoothly when 18 Brumaire, year 8, arrived. The Council of Ancients, perplexed and terrified, voted to meet in the Chateau of St. Cloud after Lucien Bonaparte, newly elected president of the Council of 500, convinced them to flee Paris for their safety. 
What put them at ease, ironically, was giving authority over the Parisian military to General Bonaparte, offering the sword a true sword to command. However, things came close to catastrophe the next day, as some ancients began to rethink their decision due to little evidence of there being any actual threat in Paris. At this, Napoleon lost his cool. Flanked by grenadiers, he stormed their meeting hall and gave a hysterical speech, by which they were notably unimpressed. He then visited the Council of 500, which received him remarkably worse. Angry deputies cried, outlaw the dictator, or even grabbed and jostled Napoleon himself, leading to the grenadiers dragging him from the hall to safety. While both Bonaparte's had succumbed to panic, Sayez proposed that they just drive the politicians out of St. Cloud Chateau. In agreement, they leapt on horseback and informed Napoleon's troops of an armed mob terrorizing the councils and that the general had almost been killed. The grenadiers promptly charged the meeting hall, bayonet set, and the deputies fled through the windows in terror. Merely a few hours later, both councils reluctantly signed off on a new provisional government, naming Sayez, Ducot, and Bonaparte chief executives of the administration. The establishment of the new regime signified the coup of 18 Brumaire's official completion. Unsurprisingly, Napoleon hailed himself as the hero of the day, and the people of France rejoiced in his establishment as a government ruler. The nation quickly joined together to support him, universally believing that Bonaparte was the man to unite France, end the civil unrest, and lead the country to victory once again. Despite Sayez seeing himself as the true leader of the coup, he was soon bested by the sword as he demanded the rank of first consul once the consulate was in place. Royalists expected Napoleon's rule would ease France back to monarchy. Unaware of his true ambitions, conservatives saw him as the stable ruler who would bring back their former influence and wealth. The Jacobin left rested easy trusting that the general would keep the nation from the clutches of absolutism. However, Napoleon had other ideas. His authority over his two colleagues as first consul allowed him to appoint government officers, including legislators, despite the system officially giving that power to the voters. Bonaparte's creation of a dictatorship hid under the guise of political stability, and in December of 1799, the Constitution of Year 8 was passed, despite containing no mention of civil rights for men, the original intention of the French Revolution. It was apparent that the nation believed sacrificing their liberties was worth the assured peace. Napoleon himself believed that he could convince the people to support anything with a firm will and backed by military strength. Though seen as the bringer of peace, Bonaparte was still a conqueror at heart and eventually converted his dictatorship into a short-lived imperial dynasty. Driven by his personal hunger for power, he spread the ideals of the revolution, leading by example through his own greatness and enviable savvy.